So let's start with symptoms. It's useful, I think, to have a model in your mind of what constitutes bipolar disorder, even if it's a load of rubbish. But the point is, there's so the, the problem with depression and bipolar disorder is the symptoms can be very diffuse. They can affect every area of the body, every area of the mind, and there's a lot of uh, different ways the condition can manifest. So uh, the purpose behind this is really to try and strike some sort of order in it. I think it's reasonable to say that the core thing that happens within bipolar disorder is that there's a variation in the rate of thinking that is central to the condition. In elation, it's speeded up. In depression, it's slowed down. So it's useful to think of it in that sense, that there's a wheel in the brain that rotates at a certain rate. Don't go looking for it. Don't ask for x-rays for it. But just pretend it's there. When somebody is depressed, it slows down. And because it slows down, the person has difficulty finding words. The flow of conversation or thoughts in the person's mind won't come. Because of that, they have less to say in conversation. The person's whole drivenness within their body then begins to change because those thoughts and the way it branches out into the brain itself determines how the person moves. Their rate of movement becomes slowed down. They're less expressive in their face. The person's eyes begin to get dead. The person is vacant. They're looking into space. They're there, but there's nobody at home type of look about the person. And they walk much more slowly. So we all have a certain rate of which, at which our thinking goes. And it's only when it changes in that way, upwards or downwards, into uh, being slowed down or speeded up, that it begins to affect so much of the person's uh, emotional and physical being. So with this slow down thinking, then, the next thing is the person has difficulty creating a spin-off in their mind onto the visual display unit. We have a visual display unit in our mind, and we use it all the time, but we're not conscious of it terribly much. If I said to you, what are you doing after the meeting this evening? What are you doing for the weekend? Have you had a holiday yet? If not, where are you thinking of going? What are you thinking of doing? Hopefully, some picture shoots up in your mind. Now, that picture in our mind is extremely important. But what you'll find is when people are depressed, they can't get a, 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 an image up onto that picture. And when you say to that person, how do you view the future? They will say things like, it's bleak, it's blank, or there's nothing there. And sure enough, that's exactly what's happening. There's actually nothing on the screen. Because there's nothing on the screen, the next thing that follows from that is the person lacks energy. Because energy is a figment of our imagination. If we see something there, like um, something exciting that we're interested in, we will pursue it. If there's nothing there, our energy flags. That's why, for example, we have more energy on a Friday, despite working hard all week. <laughs> we have got the weekend on the screen, whereas on Monday morning, when we should have plenty of energy, having rested for the weekend, if you do, the person feels fatigued. So that is an, an, an extremely important part of, of the phenomenon. The next thing is that because the thinking wheel is rotating so slowly, the person can't absorb information. It's almost as if information is coming at this wheel through the brain all the time from the external world. And if we saw those as little bits of information, they have to be strung onto this wheel. And then they eventually get inwards to the memory wheel. And that memory wheel uh, stores the information. But the point is, if this outer wheel, in a sense, is going so slowly, it's not sucking up enough of this information, therefore the person can't 
uh, pull information out of a system. So in other words, as people would say, well, I, could you try and explain to me what happens when you're depressed? What the person would say is, I see the words there, but I can't assimilate them. I can't take them in. And that's basically what's happening. It's just because this wheel is, is, is slowed down. Now, do remember what I'm saying might turn out to be a load of garbage and disproven, but I've been saying it for 20 or 30 years, and it still is reasonably valid as a central aspect of, of mood disorder. The next thing is that when a person is depressed, they're thinking... You see, normally we think ahead a certain amount. We think of what we're going to do later this evening, what we might have to do tomorrow, what we might be doing at the weekend. When a person gets depressed, as I said, they can't do that. And what happens is, as an alternative, the thinking becomes introspective. So the person then becomes extremely conscious of themselves and how uh, others see them, maybe socially conscious, social anxiety, or they'll become very aware of their body, the size of their nose, their ears, uh, whether they've got pimples, their weight, something that the person will focus. Or if somebody is quite depressed, it'll focus on maybe um, they've lost some weight recently, maybe they end up concluding they've got cancer. So these things play on a person, whereas normally when a person is in the full state of their health, their thinking is out here. It's not in on their body, okay? And the other thing then is that people tend to think about the past rather than the future, and they think about the past in a negative way. So normally we say that anything is made up of either positive or negative thoughts, when we are in good form, we look back at the past and we say, the good old days, when people were politer, there was less traffic on the road, uh, jobs were more f plenty, um, and so on and so forth. But we forget <coughs> that maybe TB was rampant. I know it's back again, but not as bad as it was. Um, there was less uh, social welfare support. Uh, unemployment was just as high. Emigration was rampant and so on. So there are good and bad points in every era. But when we're in good form, surprisingly, we actually tend to look more on the positive side. When people become depressed, that actually gets cancelled out. And this one goes up in neon lights. And frequently, it's in on the person's own being. They're looking at maybe something that they've done in the past that they feel guilty about, ashamed about, maybe something that they construe as being an evil act, uh, and it's just that the person's total focus is on the past. We all have maybe fleeting thoughts about things in the past that we're not proud of or feel embarrassed about, but when a person gets depressed, that sort of total focus on the past becomes, becomes the issue. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we have, in a sense, most of the symptoms of uh, uh, depression. What happens in elation, then, is the direct opposite. The wheel is going so fast, the person has an experience of racing thoughts. They can't switch off their mind to go to sleep. And even if they do switch it off for a while, so they'll wake up earlier because the wheel is uh, banging on again. The person has plenty of thoughts and it's projecting them into the future. So it has a 1,001 different things here on the visual display unit. And these things attract the person such that they're jumping from one thing to another to another. If you're talking to somebody like that, rather than staring into space, their, their eyes are dancing uh, because the person's eye is flicking, as it were, from one picture to another, as if they were watching uh, a series of photographs just floating across their mind. The person has tremendous energy because it's all these pictures to uh, chase after. Uh, they will frequently lose weight. Initially, they have no difficulty absorbing information from uh, their environment and will actually be uh, better than average in that sense of being able to pick up information. But once the mind starts going at a certain rate, it can, it's going too fast for the information and the person is constantly... Um, watching the pictures in their mind and watching what you're saying to them. And most of what you're saying 
the person just can't recollect. So often when people are going through a bad period of elation, they have difficulty being able to recall much of actually what happened during the elation. They might remember some row they had with somebody or maybe having to be hospitalised. But if you ask them, well, how long were you in hospital? The person might say a week. You take out their old records, it might have been six months. So, um, and it's not that their memory was knocked with medication or anything else. It's just a process of the, uh, the elation. So now, just very quickly, if we move from that to some way of helping you get a hold on signs and symptoms so that you can recognise it within yourself or within, within others. And we have this mnemonic that we use, or at least I use, I don't know who else uses it, uh, to remind myself of the symptoms of depression. So if you can't festival for two weeks, you must be depressed. F stands for feeling. In other words, being depressed. Anxious. Flat. Or empty. Any of those words will do. Why am I putting anxious there? Well, remember that anxious, people who are anxious by nature, when they get depressed, they simply get more anxious. And they will insist they're not depressed. But behind that anxiousness, you'll see all the sleep disturbance, the poor appetite, the impaired concentration, and so on, that's typical of depression. Okay, so it's just their lead symptom is often different. E is for energy. When people get depressed, they become fatigued. And that fatigue is such an important part of it that for many, many people it is the key symptom. Again, many people who get the depression of bipolar disorder experience the fatigue as the predominant symptom. They will insist they don't feel depressed. They will say, it's as if somebody filled my boots with lead, my brain with cement. In other words, nothing is moving. They're just uh, zapped in that way. S is for sleep. Now, when people are depressed, what they do is they tend to oversleep or have broken sleep. One thing they tend not to have, and this is important, is trouble getting to sleep. If a person with bipolar disorder is in a depressed state, as it is thought, but they're having a lot of trouble getting to sleep, the chances are that it's not a low because it would contradict our understanding of the racing mind. Okay? In other words, if somebody has trouble getting to sleep in the context of a, a so-called depression, one needs to ask, well, actually, are they depressed? Or is it that they're going through an unpleasant high? I'll come back to that in a moment. T is for thinking. That's the slowing down of the thinking that I mentioned. In other words, uh, slow spoken, slow movement, and difficulty with concentration. In other words, the machine has slowed down. I is for interest, where the person loses interest in the world around them. We, we develop an interest in the world around us because we make an emotional link. It's almost as if we can let out one of those uh, uh, ropes from the thinking wheel and envelop something. We look at something, we either we have an affinity for it or a repulsion from it, but it creates a feeling within us. And uh, that's where interest comes, in other words, that the people we're close to, things that have meaning for us in life, things that uh, we uh, are enthused about, um, they all diminish, but they begin to diminish with the things that are most important to us. So it might be, for somebody, their favourite uh, TV programme. For somebody else, it might be the football they follow or they lose interest in their favourite sport or whatever it may be. For other people, it's a personal relationship. 
And sometimes a person will come and say, um, I'm fed up with my job, I want to get out of here. Boom. But in fact, that may be a manifestation of the person being depressed. I'm not saying their job is perfect, but the point is every uh, day, day in, day out, they've coped with that job and gotten on with it and felt a sense of okayness with it. But when a person gets depressed, for some people, that will be the first manifestation that they're depressed. For other people, it'll be that they're no longer in love with the person they once loved, whatever the important relationship is with them for them in their life. Um, and again, when that person comes out of that depression, that relationship goes back to the way it was. So lack of interest in food, sex, religion, sport, hobby, relationship, whatever it may be. Next is V is for value, the value a person puts upon themselves. We all have a certain level of self-esteem, uh, self-worth, and that begins to dip when somebody is depressed. When somebody is mildly depressed, it might be that they don't feel terribly worthwhile. It's just a vague thought rattling around in the back of their head. When somebody gets more depressed, it may be, I'm a hopeless individual. I'd be better off if I wasn't around the place. Or the person may think at another value level that they're financially bankrupt or that their health is bankrupt in some way, that they've got cancer or something else. So some notion of poor worth. But it doesn't have to be sort of totally emotional worth. It can be, as I say, financial, uh, health-wise or something like that. It, it lodges in the person's brain. And then at the more extreme end, the person can be, in a sense, deluded about their sense of poor worth, believing and being absolutely convinced that they're wicked, hopeless individuals that should be put down, literally, or being absolutely convinced they've got cancer when there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that they have. It just lodges in the person's head. A is for aches. Many people with bipolar disorder, when they get depressed, will experience physical ailments. And that arises because there's a tension build up in the body when people are depressed. We have muscles all over our body from head to toe, in our eyes, ears, gut, heart, uh, you name it. And that tension in the muscle in those parts can produce very common symptoms like headaches across the forehead, tension in the chest, low back ache, uh, an old football injury or some sort of injury, sporting injury, uh, can act up at that time because that injury is being pulled by the muscles on either side and it uh, becomes emphasised for the person. And L is for live, not wanting to live, in other words, feeling suicidal. Now, in brief, if somebody has five or more of those symptoms for greater than two weeks, they're said to have depression. So I'm just putting that there as a list that helps you uh, deal with it because, quite honestly, it's unlikely that somebody is depressed if they don't have some of the FEST symptoms, never mind the other ones. In other words, there's a disturbance of feeling, energy, sleep, or thinking. Okay? Now, in elation, you get the complete opposite. The person will say they've never felt better. Anxiety's gone out the window. They have tremendous energy. They have trouble getting to sleep and waking early in the morning. But the getting to sleep is, is very characteristic. Sometimes it's the first symptom of, of elation. The person's thinking is speeded up. The person might feel that their head is going to explode. They've got so many thoughts. They have interest in a thousand and one uh, things and they're jumping from one uh, unfinished task to another. The person will overestimate their own worth. They will have grandiose thoughts or delusions, in other words, where they become convinced that they have some uh, enormous power to change the world politically, religiously, or whatever. The person's aches go out the window. Sometimes you'd see people who get high and might be quite disabled physically with arthritis, and their stature might be down like this, and then you'd see them when they're high, 
you actually wouldn't recognize them because they might have gained a foot, a foot and a half in height. So it can be dangerous in that sense because somebody with um, a heart problem or respiratory problem will be overdriven by the mind and their heart or, or lungs aren't able to um, facilitate that. And very often when somebody's high, suicide is not something that's going to be on their mind necessarily and they may have a sense that they're going to live forever. Now, what I want to do is to put all of those signs and symptoms now in a slightly different context. And the context is this, that we can divide any of those states into mild, moderate, and severe. So in a mild depression of bipolar disorder, the only thing a person might feel is tired, unrested, that the concentration is poor, and they're lacking confidence. So it's actually quite mild. The person frequently will not use the word depression to describe how they feel. Moderate depression is pretty much all of the signs and symptoms I've given you. Severe depression, by definition, the person is quite disabled, but in addition, they're much more likely to have psychotic experiences where they feel they're wicked, evil, damned, cancer, bankrupt, and frequently the person's intense belief like that is a serious thing because the risk of suicide at that stage is extremely high. Likewise with elation. Mild elation is so mild only maybe the next of kin, the person, if, if that person happens to be living with the individual with the illness, will spot it. Moderate relation, close friends will begin to see the person isn't well, they spot the high. And it's only with the more marked relations that actually um, acquaintances, people at work, will realise there's something wrong. But the big issue here is that the person with the elation frequently doesn't see it. And that's uh, the big aspect of management of bipolar disorder is spotting the elations. Because if elations aren't spotted, any depressions that follow uh, just don't seem to make sense. Well, where did they come from? Why did that start? Um, I was fine. I was actually feeling very good. And then suddenly this depression came from. What's that all about? Well, the, the, the secret is go back and find out and identify the elation. Because if you're overlooking that, you won't be able to deal with the depression. Now, the next thing within signs and symptoms that we need to deal with is just this conflict of when somebody is going through a high, a big high like this, it can often be a very pleasant experience. But no matter how pleasant it is, for most people, there will be moments during it where they feel very distressed. You might see somebody one moment and they're quite high, full of the joys of life, tremendous energy, enthusiastic, positive. Um, nothing seems impossible to them. You might see them five minutes later and they're distressed, bothered, agitated, weepy, and feeling awful. But when you look at the person, you know that, well, it couldn't be anything other than something that's changed within them because it happened so suddenly. There's no preceding thought. Nobody has said anything to them. There's been no communication to them from the outside world. And bang, this happens. So that unpleasant bit, you can still see it as part of the elation. But for some people, that will happen right throughout this period. And what the person will say is, I feel depressed. Or they might say anxious, or they might say frightened in a paranoid way. But depression would be the mo most common word the person will use. But when we look at the person, they seem quite different to the person who's in this depression. 
And the difference is, here, if you look, don't listen to what you're hearing for a moment. Just switch off what's going in through the ears. You will find that the person is agitated, restless, the eyes are darting, they have trouble getting to sleep at night, they're irritable or angry. In other words, they've got that sort of wound up state. Whereas in a depression proper, those don't exist. The person tends to be worse in the morning if there is a difference between day and night. They tend not to have trouble getting to sleep at night. Um, They're all slowed down, their eyes are staring into space. The person is flat. So we call this a mixed mood state. or uh, an unpleasant high. Or dysphoric hypomania. Dysphoric means just an unpleasant mood. Hypomania. Now, there's enormous debate within uh, research and uh, clinicians uh, worldwide on this um, and any of you that are familiar with this area, recently the American Psychiatric Association brought out uh, a way of trying to recategorize this, and um, it hasn't had clarified matters. Um, I think if you keep it quite simple, really, that it's, it's kind of an unpleasant mood state, and the mood may be depression, anxiousness, or fearfulness, or a mixture of all three, and flitting from one to the other every few minutes or every few hours. But behind it, there's a drivenness, there's an agitation that is not part of depression. The person complains of depression. So when somebody says to me, or a, one, a staff member would say, so-and-so is very depressed, the next thing you would be on the lookout for within the context of bipolar disorder, is it a quiet depression or that side of one? In other words, is the person agitated? Because why is it important? Because with this... If you treat this with antidepressants, you just put them up there. You make the situation worse. Whereas, in fact, that person will respond literally within hours to some type of anti elation therapy, some type of uh, thing that will bring their mood down. Whereas here, obviously, that same type of medication would worsen it. Is that clear enough? Okay. So let's move on now and just briefly deal with causation. Everyone here who has any experience of mood problems, either directly themselves or with a family member, will have their own view on why people get mood problems. And they're all valid. I've got to look at it from a broader perspective in terms of what the research evidence is and see how that tallies with other people's experience of it. The first thing to say to you is that, in a general sense, bipolar disorder appears to be a genetically inherited phenomenon that runs in families. Uh, I know that's not a pleasant uh, prospect or idea for people, um, but... They're the the, the broad facts. Um, The research would show that if you imagine it like this, that if this is a bar that has to be complete before a a person develops bipolar disorder, that on average the contribution to bipolar disorder is 70% genetic and... 30% environmental. But that is the average. It's like the average height of males in the country is whatever, 5'10". It doesn't mean every male is 5'10". There will be some people who have a genetic contribution of 90%. They may tell you of brother or sister or both, 
a parent or two, several aunts and uncles, first cousins on one side of the family, or indeed sometimes on both sides of the family, who have this condition. And when you ask what was it that triggered their illness, they might say, well, there wasn't terribly, nothing particularly much. It might have started, uh, we say, in, with a depression in, in late October, early November, which would suggest maybe it's seasonal or a manic episode that happened May, June, July, sometime like that. So the seasonal change or flight travel or change of night shift or something like that that triggered their mood. So in other words, quite an innocent everyday type of environmental phenomenon that most people can take in their strides. Sorry, in, in, in this group here. Then there would be people who, for whom it is the other way around, that it's 10% genetic and... Uh, 90% environmental before they develop bipolar. And in that instance, it may be that the person has had umpteen different um, upsetting events prior to it. Maybe a death in the family, a road traffic accident, been put on steroid medication for a chest infection, um, multiple losses, threats in the person's life, uh, increasing amount of work and it's, it's the multiplicity of all that that brings the person right up to the barrier and unleashes maybe a small genetic tendency within the person uh, thus the illness. But the average when you tot up the 90-10, the 10-90, the 70-30, the 30-70 when you tot them up that's what, what comes out. What is it uh, from a genetic point of view that's relevant. Where are the genes? There's been a lot of research done over the past 20 years and nothing terribly substantial has come out of that to date. What we do know is that there's no one single gene that is the cause of bipolar disorder. It's a multiplicity of small genes that probably act in some cascading way within the condition. Uh, it's much, uh, the, the genetics of bipolar disorder, what we do know is that it's much more complex than the genetics of diabetes, uh, which in a sense is complex, or even uh, blood pressure or coronary artery disease. But many of those conditions do have uh, several different aspects of it, so there's still a long way to go. And one of the things that's emerged from this research is that maybe our understanding of bipolar disorder isn't as good as we might think it is. In other words, that we conceptualise it in a certain way, but do we actually fully understand the symptoms? Do we know what, how patients who have these conditions see it and how much of it is a projection of our own imaging of what their symptoms might be onto the condition? So there's an awful lot of work that has to be done in terms of going back and looking at how we interpret these things. From an environmental point of view, are there certain environmental factors that contribute? Um, there are um, things such as um, medications, steroids, uh, certain treatments that are used for Parkinson's, certain medications that are used for blood pressure can have an effect on uh, mood within bipolar disorder. We also know that stimulants such as caffeine, um, certain uh, hallucinogenic agents, uh, people with bipolar disorder or a tendency, a latent tendency, unreleased tendency, are much more likely to have an adverse effect to those substances. Uh, losses in childhood uh, are somewhat important, but not as important as people with the condition would say. Now, I know that sounds contradictory, but le let me put it this way to you, that often what happens is that people with uh, mood disorders will often grow up in families where other members of the family have mood problems, maybe sometimes not diagnosed mood disturbances. But that environment created by the parents 
or other elder people in the family determines that environment that the person grows up in. But most of the research still points to the, the, the major contribution to the condition being due to the genetics. Maybe it will take 10, 20, 30 years before we fully understand the genetics of, of these conditions. So the next thing, just briefly, to deal with is the impact um, of these conditions on um, the family. One of the most important things to realize is that mood disorders, by their very nature, are disturbances of emotion. And what links us to the people in our family are our emotions. So the first thing that becomes manifest when somebody becomes depressed or elated is that it causes a wave within that relationship. That wave is picked up at a very uncanny level, even before the person is intellectually aware that the person is unwell. The person senses it. Let me give you an example. Okay. If I'm treating somebody with quite a bad depression and it's slow, the person is slow to recover and they're coming along quite frequently for outpatient visits and there's a family member coming along with them, I can sometimes see that the person is improving. Not because I can see any change in the person, but the relative is beginning to get depressed or agitated. And lo and behold, within days, you will actually see the person with the depression improving. Now, I don't think it's a response. It's like, oh, I better get better. <laughs> uh, John is getting very upset with me and um, the, the relationship is in danger or whatever. I think it's that the persons at an emotional level have twigged that there is a change in the person who is depressed. They can sense an improvement. And it almost unconsciously gives their emotional brain, the carer or the relative, permission to somewhat lay down tools and take a break on this one. <laughs> okay? So, if a useful way to conceptualize it is that if, if we are, in a sense, emotional jelly beans, and this is our emotional being, let's say a person with uh, the condition and a relative, there's a very close interface. We know the do's and don'ts in relationships. We know that so-and-so doesn't like the door left open. We know that uh, you better uh, clean up after you at the countertop or, you know, th there are a thousand and one different things that determine our manifestations of our relationships. When somebody gets depressed, what tends to happen is they shrink emotionally. They withdraw. And what do they do then? They would say, so-and-so's withdrawn from me because they'll feel that void, they'll feel that emptiness. Thus, the person will either attack the relative and say, you don't seem to care for me anymore, or they will sense that there's a void in the relationship, or they would cling to the person where they're running around. Um, as somebody said, going out to the line when they're out the clothes just to make sure they're not separated from the person. Phoning them at work, whatever it may be. And that's often difficult then for a family member to cope with. When somebody goes high, what happens is they expand in that emotional sense and that emotion then impinges on the relative. They're louder, they're more demanding, more insisting. Uh, the volume of the voice has gone up. All of that intrudes on the person and they sometimes they can't work out what's going on, what's all that about. They just feel extremely uncomfortable within themselves. And that then causes conflict within the relationship. So that's sort of, in a very simplified way, the sort of dynamic that happens within relationships. 
Now, what then happens is this, that once the family member realises that the person is unwell, when they've tweaked it, there's something not right here, they want to do the right thing. They want to read about the condition. They want to bring the person to get help. The person might want to go to get help, but the person will be patient, relative will be patient, sympathetic, supportive, and encourage the right thing. That goes on for a number of months or sometimes years. It takes a while, quite a while, very often in the beginning, to get a complex mood problem sorted out, partially because the person who is unwell is rejecting the phenomenon, rejecting help, or not being able to access it in an appropriate way. That family member, that relative, is still there at it through thick and thin, doing their very best. But then as time goes on, they begin to get a bit annoyed about things. They would say things like, you should try this, you should... Have you gone to yoga? Have you tried Pilates? Um, Omega-3, acupuncture, all these suggestions, all fine in themselves, there's nothing wrong with them, but what they're representing at that stage is a sense of agitation where the family member is becoming impatient. And that impatience is a, a sense that things are beginning to change. If that doesn't work, that sort of agitation, often family members begin to distance. They don't want to hear. They're listening, as it were, but not actually listening at the same time when the person gives account of how they got on with their visit to the doctor or what's happening at work or whatever the latest problem is that the person brings to them. And eventually it gets to the point where they just walk away from the situation. Now, often we would hear then, as clinicians from patients, how awful family members are. How could they do that? How could she do that? How could he be so mean? Well, what's basically happening is nothing different than any of us would do if we're in the same situation. And indeed I've seen it. I've seen people who've had the mood problem themselves come in and complain to me about how awful their family members are and maybe X number of years down the road the shoe's on the other foot. The one-time patient is now the carer. The former relative is now somebody with depression. And lo and behold, you can remind the person, do you remember what you used to say? You know? So we all do it, that's the point. Simple, you know, a gadget that goes wrong at home. What do you do? You go get out, get out the booklet. You read about it. You try and press the right knob and turn this and plug it in and plug it out and do all the things that you're advised to do. It doesn't work. What happens then? You begin to get agitated. You hit it a slap. <laughs> right? And then eventually you walk away and say, they don't make them the way they used to or blast the IT industry or whatever it may be. So we, we all respond in that way to situations like that. So it's no different. So the important thing, the important thing here is to try and keep family members on board in terms of the management of it. Because when we come to look at management, the key thing in management of bipolar disorder is early recognition of the condition, good knowledge, we go through a list of things, but the key thing is it's very, very hard to treat this condition if you're the only member on the team. You need uh, support from people around you, but, but sort of kind of technical support where there's specific jobs to do in terms of helping you spot early symptoms of relapse. Spot particularly the emergence of a high, because if that can be caught and switched off, within days or within hours, the person doesn't end up having to go to hospital, which they may have to do if it's let drift for four or five days. Uh, They don't lose their job. They don't end up breaking up their relationship, upsetting or uh, causing difficulties and ripples in their life that they can't often put back together again. Okay. So just going to park that for, to one side for a moment and deal a little bit with medication. And it's just a few broad principles. I think it's true to say that the management of the depression of bipolar disorder or of the uh, marked highs and lows has primarily got to be with medication. 
There is no evidence anywhere of any type of intervention which on its own is likely to be effective or more effective than medication. Now again, I know that's something that people have difficulty getting their heads around. But if it's a case that you want to control um, or be in charge of what's happening in your head, you've got to look at what tools are available uh, and have a proven ability to work. Medication is by no means foolproof, but for many, many people, it is still the most effective thing that turns their lives around. That does not mean to diminish in any way the importance of other things once the medication is in place. But it's very difficult for somebody whose mind is racing, if not impossible, to sit down and benefit from mindfulness when they're depressed. For example, if you send somebody who has severe depression to mindfulness, they just can't take it in. Now, that's bad enough, but even a worse thing in a one way, another way, is that it gets a bad name within that person's head. And when their mood actually improves and you recommend mindfulness, they say, no, I can't go back to that. It was such a horrible experience. So, and it's the same with CBT, same with uh, psychotherapy. One has got to be very careful that the broad aspect of the mood is brought under some sort of control before you start putting in place many other therapies that can be very helpful. Learning about the illness, psychoeducation, relaxation therapy, the importance of diet, the importance of uh, sleep routine, uh, eating habits, alcohol, all these things, they're all important. But the percentage contribution of each one of them isn't as big as you might imagine. You might read about them a lot. They might take up that amount in the document you're reading. Medication might take out that much. And it's then very difficult for the person themselves who are trying to inform themselves about the condition to have a balanced view of what actually works. Right. Next thing is the focus on treatment is trying to stabilise the mood rather than jump in headfirst in treating a depression or treating an elation. Now, they have to be treated, of course, but the whole emphasis from a management point of view is realising that there are different patterns to the, the illness. There is what we call bipolar 1. And this is where the person has a big high. A big high means literally one that's bad enough to warrant admission to hospital or quite a disruptive influence on the person's life. In other words, where they've bust up a relationship uh, because of the high, they've gotten into trouble at work, uh, they've run into major financial difficulties, it's been evident to the family and maybe neighbours and friends that the person went through a period of very definite unwellness, and then it's followed by a low. We know, for example, that the most effective treatment for treating that condition and for preventing its recurrence is lithium. Lithium um, doesn't always get a good press because it's a cheap drug. It's an old drug, but it's still, as of last year and the year before, research papers have come out indicating that it is more effective and safer than any of the other of the mood stabilizers on the market. It doesn't, because, again, it doesn't make big monies for drug companies, there's nobody advertising it or publicizing it or paying people to write articles on it and so on. So it's just one of those phenomena. So to conduct any of these drug trials outside drug companies, basically nobody's got the money to do it. Um, but the, the evidence is there. Uh, it's not for everybody, but for probably well over 90% of people who have this sort of pattern where it's a high followed by a low, been well for a number of months, and then another episode, and then another episode, lithium is the most effective treatment in those instances. Now, it needs careful management. I'm not going to go into that in terms of blood tests and renal function and so on. But most people uh, who go on lithium and for whom it works, um, they get 50, 60 years out of the treatment. 
and it's, it's, it's pretty effective. The next type of mood problem that needs to be identified briefly are not a, a separate type in, in many ways, but one I think needs, needs a title in itself, and that's where the person has unipolar, i.e. one pole, mania. By the way, the word mania means speed it up. So somebody must have uh, thought about the speeding up process. And depression actually means slow down. That was the original meaning of the word when they came out, in other words. Because that's what was grossly obvious to people when they first... Pres- well, when people began to study it. You know, what is the big difference? The big difference is so-and-so is very quiet, withdrawn, they say nothing. This other person doesn't stop talking, can't sit still, and so on. Now, the point about this is this group, um, maybe only uh, 20, 30 percent will settle with lithium alone, and others mean, need what we call anti psychotic mood stabilizers. And they are things like, forgive the spelling. Uh, these are things like Zyprexa, Rispidal, Suricule, um, in other words, um, basically those drugs are also used as antipsychotics, but when they're used in this instance, it's to quell the elation. The big problem for people who have recurring episodes like this is it's very difficult for the person to come down fully enough out of the condition to be able to absorb the information uh, in terms of the damage they're causing in their lives. In other words, when somebody comes down out of a high, if they go into a depression, they can assimilate that information and they can then... It dawns on them how disruptive the condition has been in their lives. And they can begin to make preventative approaches towards uh, engaging a relative in terms of spotting relapses taking their medication, getting tablet boxes, being careful about alcohol, coffee, all these things. But somebody who is uh, not sort of... They come down to a normal mood, but sometimes after a tragedy or something significant going wrong in life, like a high, if a person's mood doesn't come down into a little bit of depression, they don't feel the pain and thus the need to change. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So that's a real, real problem. And it, it often, until the person is hit very hard by a few hard knocks with this condition over a number of years, it's only then that the person begins to realise uh, what, what's, what's happening. Now, the next type of pattern I'm going to refer to, because of its it's, it's quite common, would be where a person has what we call a unipolar depression. Uh, maybe an episode in their teens, 20s, late 20s, and the interval between them is getting shorter. But then maybe in their 30s, 40s and 50s, what's beginning to happen is that each time the person has an episode... There's a little high afterwards, but as time goes on, that high gets more marked. And that then, at a later stage, can go on to uh, frequent cycles of mood. Now, this is untreated or treated, uh, well, say inadequately treated, but... Um, so, for example, if somebody's having these recurrent depressions and they're not treated or they're treated with antidepressant medication, if you follow that person up over the years, their mood will move from recurring unipolar depression to what we call bipolar 2. And that's where the person has lows, generally followed by highs. But the highs aren't too bad. So they're, they're lesser highs. Uh, they're not as disruptive. But the big issue with that, those highs is that that high determines the next low. 
Okay? So, to stop that, you've got to switch off this one. Okay? So, it's, again, it's a cyclical phenomenon. And that then, as I say, merges with rapid cycling moods where a person is having four or more episodes of mood swings in the year. Now, traditionally, lithium isn't terribly effective there, so what's often most effective are the mood-stabilizing anticonvulsants. And there are things like Epilim, Tegretol, and Lamictal to a lesser extent. So we try and avoid using antidepressants in these instances. For example, if somebody has a recurring unipolar depression, but they have a family history where there's somebody with bipolar disorder, we know that that person is at increased risk of having highs, and therefore you use antidepressants very sparingly. If you have got to use them, you use them for a brief period and then try and uh, uh, stop using them. And very often those sort of recurring unipolar depressions can be stabilized with one of these compounds or, or with lithium. Um, and as I say, I'm not going to go beyond that with, with medications because it's a whole separate talk in itself. But I'd be quite happy to take questions at the end on it. How are we doing time-wise? Five minutes. <laughs> Five minutes, okay. So uh, we'll maybe move on then to uh, the two last sections. One is just general maintenance and what it is a person needs to do to try and make sense of all of this. Well, the first thing is... If you want to beat it, know it. When we're faced with something that's awful, our initial response is, no, bury your head, turn our eyes away, avoid it. Uh, bring your head around, try and look at it squarely in the face. Um, you have got to show the lead. Get the information, get it into your head, give yourself time to assimilate it. Curse as much as you want. Don't kick the cat and uh, give it a chance. You know, try and face up to it. Take ownership of it. Don't run away from it. Um, secondly, I suppose, I suppose knowing it, I'm talking about both in an intellectual sense and an emotional sense. Not, not, not just intellectually, i.e. the facts about it the figures, why it happens, etc. That's all the, the intellectual side. The emotional side is, is takes years for people to come to terms with it. Um, I'm always amazed when people say, ah, it's a great illness. <laughs> <laughs> Not too bad. I always say to myself, well, they ain't depressed today. <laughs> In other words, Things are on, a bit on the upside. Um, so it's, it's not an easy condition for people to be with, either at a personal experience or in terms of family. So it's, it's, it's important to give yourselves time to, to address that. And very often people benefit enormously from counselling or psychotherapy as a way of helping digest that process because it is, in many respects, a type of grief people have got to go through in addition to the illness. So, um, acknowledge it. In other words, don't, don't deny it in the sense of um, keeping your family outside. Um, I don't want anything to do with this. I don't want you involved in the care. Uh, don't be coming and uh, checking up on me. 
um, as soon as I'm out of this place, I'm off to Brazil. <laughs> Their head will follow them to Brazil, so they better get used to it. In other words, acknowledging the condition, again, uh, takes time. It's, it's not by any means easy. The third thing is let family in and give them time. Families will often blame themselves for the condition and say, if only I did such and such, or if only I was stricter, or if only I got that bike for Christmas, or I did this, that, or the other. But, you know, these are irrelevant things. But, you see, that's what happens when people, because they've got to go through a grieving process and assimilation and getting used to it, and they will blame themselves or somebody, because always, you know, when something goes wrong, there's always somebody to blame. And, but that blame can be outrageous. Um, it can be, and is almost always, in fact, poorly directed. Uh, and that's the problem. And it's, for, it's important for people to, to realise that. Always when something goes wrong, there's blame. It's either directed outwards or inwards. We either blame ourselves or somebody else. But it's, it's trying to see what that anger is and trying to put a bridle on it and put it to good, good effect. Uh, family need emotional support. Going to a support group, meeting with others, talking about it. Uh, So the most important thing that a person can do, I think, is letting their family into the problem Uh, because then there's a team and that team then can work together quite effectively to overcome this. Um, When people have a family member involved, um, the person has less hospitalizations, less relapses, uh, less loss of job, less breakup of relationships, uh, better productivity, better lifestyle. It's just, um, it, it, it's so important to try and keep that, keep that going. So that if you see family getting to the point of impatience or agitation, they're still on board at that stage. It's when they're looking at you blankly and uh, they appear to be hearing, but there's nobody at home. That's when the, the trouble starts. So the next phase after that then is the spotting phase. And I'm putting a line there just to emphasize the importance of this. This is a term derived by aware members about uh, the condition. People very often can spot a depression because it's painful. People can't spot an elation because it's actually pleasant. No matter how technically qualified the person is in psychiatry, psychology, social work, whatever it is, if that person becomes high, they won't see it. It's, it's, it's a given. It's only if it's unpleasant that they're going to spot it because the mind will rationalise itself. It'll say, oh, I only got three hours sleep last night. Why? Well, I had so much to do. Or I think I drank too much coffee before I went to bed. There'll always be a reason. And the slightly high mind is great for coming up with quite imaginative reasons to explain why the person is managing for the past month on two to three hours sleep at night. Now, there are three ways you can spot a relapse. You can take the ordinary signs and symptoms. They're there in literature, books, videos, whatever it may be. And they're, they're all useful. I'm not, not knocking them. But when it comes to uh, the key issue of... Um, their usability, they're not particularly good. The next way of spotting um, uh, a relapse is to know what your personal sign is. What we mean by that is that when somebody is high or low, their behaviour changes, and it will often change in a way that's personal to them. So somebody might, for example, uh, wear a certain item of clothing when they're high, or a different type of uh, uh, clothing when they're low. But particularly when somebody's high, that clothing might be sort of uh, 
ver stand out either in colour or in its uh, design or whatever um, that you know people just uh, see it a mile off, where the person who's high actually doesn't see it themselves. This is well, I like this item, I like this pullover, or I like this skirt, or whatever it may be. Um, but the family know immediately that the person's mood has changed. Nothing has been said, just the item of clothing. Or it may be some people have often said who don't smoke will suddenly start smoking. Um, and so on. So there are personal signatures like that that the family know. So it's important that the person is aware of what that signature is, but that they don't abuse the information. Because often what will happen is the person knows they're high because they realise they've just gone into the shop and bought a cigar um, two or three cigarettes. That's all they need, two or three. But they conceal it from the family. Okay. The only foolproof way of working out whether a person's mood changes is to have a relative who helps spot that relapse. Now, people would say, well, I'm not, that's too, going too far. That's like mind control. But the point is, if you don't put somebody on your team that's going to help you spot this at an early stage, it means the elation can do what it wants. So you taking control as a good manager and saying, I want you to tell me if you notice my mood is slipping. So enrolling a relative whose judgment you trust, who is strong enough to stand up to you if there's a bit of high there and can tell you what's what. And you have given them permission that if they think you're high, that they take the car keys away or the credit card or tell you to stay off work or get you to the doctor, whatever it may be. You're giving them permission in a well state to do that, should that happen. And that is the key issue. Now, what happens is once that goes into place is depressions get nipped in the bud, number one. Number two is all the consequences of those don't happen. And number three is the subsequent depressions get prevented. Okay. Maybe not immediately, maybe it takes a while to catch up with it. But you know the big issue in treating um, very often these bipolar phenomena is not so much that they're untreatable, at times they can seem like that, but they're not. The problem is that the, the person themselves with the condition gets in the way and because they're unwell, it's very difficult for them to access the treatment. So there's a big gap or time lag between the onset of the condition and the successful resolution of it. You can speed that up enormously by having a family member or friend or somebody close to you, preferably somebody who lives in the same house or apartment or whatever it may be. Um, now, number six, alcohol. Know your limit. For many people, uh, one drink taken three nights in a row can be enough to alter the mood. Uh, for other people, uh, larger amounts are, are okay. But quite honestly, if a person is going beyond uh, two drinks, maybe two or three times a week, they need to ask themselves, you know, where, where is this leading to? Because, again, remember the people with mood problems and the anxiety and the sleep disturbance and the poor concentration and the hurt feelings, alcohol and being addicted to it becomes all too easy. So once it goes beyond a certain point, a person needs to draw a line under it. Uh, I'm sure I've forgotten a lot of things like uh, tablet boxes, uh, graphing your mood. In other words, it's, if your mood is not at a good level, try and get some good way of graphing it or keeping a daily diary of your mood because it's invaluable. You can't be going along to an outpatient clinic and saying how you've been over the past three months with any degree of reliability unless you're keeping a record. Can any of you tell me what way you were feeling last Tuesday evening? I don't mean yesterday now. We let that one off. Last Tuesday. I can't anyway. So it's, it's, it's an impossible task. And all of your treatment 
and changes in treatment is going to be determined by your answer to that question. It's, 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 it's absolutely vital that these things are logged. Now, the final bit that I want to mention is family members. When a person recovers from an episode of depression or elation or both, it's important that they realise that they need to go back and talk to the people in their lives who they may have hurt during the period of elation or depression or caused problems for or worries for. Because what tends to happen is this. If a person has a number of these episodes and each time family don't want to upset the person by saying, well, God, you should have seen the way you were or the disruption you caused or the, how frightened we all were for your welfare or whatever it may be, that gets swept under the carpet because the family don't want to bring it up and the person themselves with the condition are embarrassed about it, mortified. Eventually, there's enough dirt swept under the carpet that somebody's going to trip up over it. And what actually happens is the key person in the family who is supporting that person begins to walk away from the situation. As I said, first they get agitated, but then they walk away. And the last person to realise what's actually happening is the person themselves with the condition. It's important to face up to the hurt that the illness has caused. It's not that anyone is blaming you, but ultimately the person with the condition has to take ownership of it and go and face people and say... The relatives would say, oh, no, forget about that. If you don't allow your relative to let out their hurt feelings, that's what causes the damage. It's not an intellectual exercise. You must allow them to talk about it. You mustn't make excuses. You mustn't say, well... Just it's, it's, they have to be allowed to, in a sense, go through a mini grieving uh, process rather than burying all this stuff inside. It's not a case of blaming the person with the illness. It's actually trying to facilitate keeping the support that's necessary in the person's life uh, such that their mood remains stable. And the final thing I just want to go to is just a little thing about um, the importance of... Um, regularity in the life of somebody with bipolar illness. What's coming through uh, from research more and more these days is that the whole importance of um, circadian rhythms and rhythms in the brain and the effect that they have on uh, a person's emotional and physical well-being. When light comes through our eyes it sends a message to what's called the supra suprachiasmic nucleus. And that's simply a clock. Now that's a big clock in terms of the amount of nerves that are there. That clock then regulates a whole orchestra of clocks throughout the body. In the brain, heart, lungs, gut, they all go at a different rate. This one contra- controls mainly the, what's called the circadian rhythm, and that's a clock that runs on a 24-hour and 10-minute cycle. But it's based on the light that comes in here. It regulates it. But so do other things like social contact, the time you have a meal at, how much exercise you take during the day, the amount of food you eat. And what's come out of research is that It's blue light that is important. So it was all, you know, the the standard teaching was that we, light came in through rods and cones and went into the brain and regulated things in that way. But it's now realised that all of this system is dependent on 
a, a different type of photosensitive system in the retina and that that photosensitive system determines 80% of the control over this, which in turn controls all of the other rhythms in the body. Now that might be a long way of getting around to the point. And the point is this, that the most important thing you can do from regulating these rhythms is go to bed on time. Get up eight hours later, no matter how you're feeling. Drag yourself out of the bed. Try and not nap during the day and have your meals at fixed times. So for people with sleep problems, unless that's been done, because if... See, so many people will come along and say they've uh, uh, a sleep problem. I only get... Let's see, let me think of one I had the other day. Somebody who came and said, what was he saying? Oh yeah, he wakens up every morning at 2 a.m. And he's awake from 2 until 4. Then goes back to sleep for an hour. And he's shattered all day. So if one took that at face value, that's, that's it. But if then you find, he says he comes home from work in the evening and he snoozes for about a half an hour. I called in his wife. How long does he snooze for? Well, when he comes in, he snoozes before the dinner, and he wakens up in time for his supper, <laughs> and then goes to bed. So from the time he... If you take the time he started at and measure it to the time he wakens during the night... That is his eight hours. Okay? So the point is, the reason he's shattered during the day is that he's going on a transatlantic shift job every night. Okay? So it's it's regulating that because it does affect concentration, energy, enthusiasm, and mood. Okay? So it's just something that uh, I think you're going to hear more and more about because it's been shown that downing tools in terms of not exposing yourself to uh, flick, flick, flick on the television or flick, flick, flick on your iPad or whatever it is with all that bright light coming at you and a stimulatory effect is important. So the people need to sort of wind down for an hour or so before they go to bed so that the brain isn't being stimulated in that way. For many people who don't have mood problems, that mightn't seem that important because they seem to cope with it. But again, you've got to come back to this thing that people who have bipolar disorder, their brains are much more as sensitive to the effect of light change, to coffee, to stimulation, and so forth. So that it's, they've got to work a little bit harder at protecting it. And then, obviously, the other big thing that's uh, come through again and again from research is the importance of regular exercise, that it is uh, a very effective form of preventing depression and keeping a person's mood stable. Um, The evidence um, is that it only... um, I mean, much of the evidence would suggest that it, it is as effective as many antidepressants in terms of helping a person smooth, get up. Now, it can be hard for a person to do that, obviously, when they're depressed. But even starting in small ways, it can prove effective. 20 minutes beyond my time. Thank you. You've been very patient.